All right, good evening. Welcome everyone to A2 New Tech. I'm Brian Kelly. Thank you for coming out tonight. Keeping our monthly meetup alive here in late December. Um, so I've been hosting this for a little over a year, uh, but it's been going on much longer than that. Since 2009, this event has been happening the third Tuesday of every month. And we've had over 100 meetups, over 300 companies have pitched, and there's over 5,000 members uh, in this group. So I uh, really appreciate a lot of familiar faces coming out uh, tonight, but as well as anyone here for the first time that you've checked this meetup. Awesome, welcome first timers. We always have a good new showing, so we, we appreciate you coming out. Um, my uh, one thing I tell all the new folks here coming to remember is, if you do nothing else, just meet one interesting person here this evening that you stay in touch with. Um, we, we got this meetup group started uh, years ago because there were lots of interesting entrepreneurs in the community, but there wasn't always an obvious way to connect that wasn't online, and online left something to be desired. Uh, so kept this going, said, you know, we got a great community here. Everyone loves to make time to meet with each other, but we don't always know where to do it. So. Uh, we've supported that while also having a format of people pitching, so long before Shark Tank ever made this a thing. Um, so everyone, the format's five minutes for each presenter. Five presenters will pitch their business, the problem they're solving, what makes them different, a little bit about their traction, and then there'll be five minutes for audience questions. Um, and they're always really good. Uh, when we get to that part, just raise your hand and I'll call you out. Um, Roger down here, big thanks to Roger. Roger records our events every week, um, so that, or every month. Thank God it's not every week. It'd be a lot of work. Uh, every month, and uh, does it on his own time. So check out R2Vive if you ever want any actual other video production for your, for your company. Um, so tell you a little bit about why we do it. Um, oh, who, is, who in here's company is hiring for any kind of roles? Just show of hands. All right, who's looking for a job or could be interested? All right, now you know who to talk to. So uh, we'll make, a, we'll also have time at the end for community announcements. So if you're either uh, plugging a job, looking for a job, plugging another meetup, um, anything at all, uh, there'll be plenty of time for that. So think what your ask is and get ready to make that in a little bit. Uh, other thank yous to uh, the Entrepreneurship Clinic at the U of M Law School. They host us, that's where we're here. It's kind of quiet around campus, but uh, this, is, this has been our home for the last couple of years. So uh, if you're looking to connect with somebody there, Dana Thompson is the director at the Entrepreneurship Clinic. She sometimes comes out to these, to these meetup events. Uh, A2 Geeks is a nonprofit dedicated to making Southeast Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. The organization's been around for a while and helps create events like this and Coffeehouse Coders and other uh, meetup events in the, in the area. Mentioned Roger, man with the video down here, and um, I don't do this all, all alone by myself. There's other organizers, uh, Doug Song, Zach Steinler, Scott, I saw Scott up in the back, uh, David and, and other folks that help curate the people that we have present every, every month. And um, yeah, they're, it's, a, it's a great crew. This is all just community effort. We all work in tech and I uh, want to see that community fostered more, so that's why we're here. Uh, I think I told you about the agenda. Oh, afterward, if you have to step out, but you want to like connect with some people later, Pizza House is where everyone gathers after the event, so if you want to grab some pizza and keep chatting about the interesting presentations tonight, you can always find folks over there. I don't know the address, but you can Google it. It's a couple blocks from here. Uh, if you know somebody, if you see some presentations tonight and like, I should pitch, or I know somebody else who should pitch. Email organizers at a2newtech.org, and that'll go to me and a handful of other people, and we'll get you up here. We have some room in January. I think like probably like two or three slots filled right now, and uh, February is pretty open too. So uh, hit me up. I like to recommend a podcast that I've come across in the last month, uh, either an individual episode or a new podcast I've checked out. Um, I've been, a, I've been working for a client recently that works in kind of an old school industry, uh, asset tracking, and uh, I was trying to help them find some companies that have a good, uh, modern, like thoughtful spin on their, on their marketing, their B2B marketing, and I came across this company called Fleetio, 
that does uh, fleet asset tracking management. And I was like blown away by their website. And I'm like, where are these guys located? So we're out there in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama does have a tech scene. And it's pretty decent. Uh, and I discovered a podcast there called uh, Bolt Future. It's put together by somebody named Jeremy Carter. Uh, so boltfuture.co. Uh, the interview was with that I, that I came across this podcast was with Tony Somerville. He was the founder of Fleetio. And uh, his, his pitch of describing what Bold Future is all about, he says, regardless of where you work or what you do, whether you're a corporate employee, startup founder, nonprofit director, or anything in between, if you're intent on in making the world a better and more interesting place, Bold Future is for you. Uh, so that's his, his pitch. I just say it was a good, it's good to hear those kind of candid founder stories in, uh, that has a focus in an area that I don't know much about, but after learning a little bit about Birmingham, I want to go visit. Anyone been to Birmingham, know anything about the Birmingham tech scene? See, nobody in here does. All right, so go find out about that. We're gonna jump right into things, slight reordering um, of the presentations. We're gonna move iLob Radio to the end, and Aurora Networks is gonna be our first presenter tonight. So I'd like to welcome Mario and Matthew up. Uh, the the one-liner on Aurora, Aurora, they'll, they'll correct me on this. Aurora is working on a modern cloud-based networking platform, enabling organizations to stay invisible on the internet while providing teams secure, reliable access to internal systems. Let's give a welcome to Mario and Matthew. Thank you, everybody. We've, uh, All right, yeah, we're having some projector issues with dynamic contrasting, so um, hopefully everyone can see this in the back, but sure can. we'll try to do what we can. Um, so I am Matt, this is Mario, and we're Royal Networks. And so what we're doing is providing a up-and-coming um, cloud platform uh, for networking um, to provide small businesses with a new tool set to protect their corporate networks um, and their other corporate resources. And so, small businesses are really becoming under attack. They're really under siege nowadays. Uh, according to Symantec in 2015, 43% of cyber attacks were against businesses. And not just businesses, but businesses with 250 or less employees. And there's one unique characteristic about businesses that fall within um, this category, and that's that these businesses generally don't have the resources or capital necessary to uh, have their own IT staff. So they're generally contracting out to third parties, um, IT consultancies, and so they're really the ones kind of um, setting up their computer networks uh, and doing all the hard lifting. Um, the problem is really no one's safe anymore, and, and uh, what this really comes down to is IT consultancies have a lot of clients. They can't spend dedicated time, they can't spend dedicated resources on one client. So what tends to happen is uh, their clients tend to run outdated software, outdated hardware, and as we know, just about every day there's a new attack uh, that's found against a, a, wide, a wide array of hardware and software. So uh, they just don't have the, the ability to stay on top of things and uh, stay on top of cybersecurity like the large companies do. Um, and so to compound this and make it even worse, um, these small companies are starting to look to um, offer more modern accommodies such as letting their employees work from anywhere, bring their own devices into the workplace. Uh, and especially a lot of them are starting to look to uh, pushing a lot of their resources or compute out to the cloud, so AWS are existent. So we already have this kind of this, this state they're in where they're not very protected, they're not very up to date, and then they're just making it even more complex by adding on all these new different services and different ways to um, access the resources. So if we look at how the solution has been uh, done up until now, uh, the idea is that a company has an internal network of resources, phones, servers, different databases uh, and whatnot. And you've got you know, an office list environment for a lot of distributed teams, especially in the tech industry. And so uh, they're, they're having to have some sort of consultancy uh, or, or something, you know, some small business, maybe they have one IT person, maybe none, install uh, a piece of hardware. And that hardware is usually a firewall and a, you know, a VPN, right? And most of you have used this before. Uh, so with that, they've got this single point of failure, right? They've got an open link onto their network and they've got some domain like vpn.company.com uh, that always points to this, this source. And so 
that, that slide before that talked about this, the, the stats with you know, most of these attacks, well, it's because the attacker is easily finding this company's network, right? And once they, they have that, they can look at the box, and the box might be four years old and hasn't been updated in two years, right? Running some archaic version that has 30 exploits that are out there, which are easy, easy to find and, and, uh, and, and work through. So, let's go to the next slide. So how do we change the equation? This box is no longer here. There's nothing pointing to this box. This box is just a firewall that denies all, it denies everything. There's no open entry into their network at all. We do that by having the resources they need actually shared out to us. Now we're running in the cloud, so we, you know, redundancy, failover, continuous security, that continuous protection, we can provide that, right? Uh, a box sitting in a basement uh, in a telephone rack that you need a consultancy to come out to update isn't going to be cutting edge. So we can do that. And so they share their resources through us, and now all of their clients connect through us to get to any resources, anywhere they are. We can also streamline this so, uh, you know, certain policies uh, require companies to have all traffic go through them from their employees. We can actually take them back out to the internet as well securely. And so this is kind of a uh, general slide about some of the key uh, features that we're bringing to the table. Uh, the, the core thing here is that Cisco, Juniper F5, most of these companies want to talk to you and sell you a very expensive solution. And that solution is a box with support, licensing, and other uh, contracts and uh, costly things. A small business with 6, 10, 15, 50 people doesn't have time for this kind of thing and usually doesn't have the IT resources to support that. Uh, so uh, we bring a lot of these features and and take questions and talk more about them. We'll also be at Peace House. So, all right. Thanks, guys. Question: Few months ago, there was an attack on Dropbox and other. Um, I think it's cloud-based systems. How would you, your system, be able to fight that off? That is going to be the most asked question uh, that we're ever going to get. So I'm going to give you a really crappy answer because <laughs> we're still working on it. No, um, we are going to have a pretty hardcore dedicated team. We're going to have third parties. We're going to use tiered security models. We're going to use the latest protocols. I can say all these things to make you feel better, and we're going to do the best we can, the best that Dropbox or Facebook or Google is doing to make you trust them. Um, but you know, we are still an endpoint in the cloud, right? And so we are still a cloud provider that people can access. And so we can't say we're 100% the most secure thing in the world. We're not. But I can guarantee you we are going to be better than the 43% of companies, the solution that they had uh, in, in that stat and getting exploited. So we are going to provide you a, a better layer of, of security uh, to get to your network resources than is out there uh, today, especially with uh, companies who aren't keeping on updates and stuff like that. So, If you're not using a VPN today, is there any reason why this would, your solution would present a reason to start using one? Uh, it depends on your need. Probably not. Well, there, there are definitely use cases, especially as people start to migrate to AWS in the cloud. So to be able to secure those resources in a way that you can ensure that only your, your employees or you know, uh, right. vendors or whoever needs to get access, they have secure access instead of what we're seeing a lot of people just kind of opening up their AWS resources to the world or having these, um, they kind of just have jump points to kind of get into AWS. So really kind of insecure methods to access those resources. Um, so uh, basically we offer this, this cloud VPN is kind of what we're calling it to begin with to start. Um, so that, you know, if someone is just an AWS, then they can leverage us to better control the access to those resources. It's, it's the idea of like overly networking, right? So you can be in digital ocean, be rack space, you can be in AWS and have all of those resources pooled and access everything using us. Uh, and it's the same concept where you can kind of cut them off denial to the world so they're not publicly accessible. Right. Question. Do you have a piece of hardware on site at the companies that are sharing their information out to your cloud platform? How does that occur? Yeah, so um, one of the, the things we wanted to do from the start was to not create hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of boxes out there, people paid plenty of money for the boxes they have. Um, so our goal is to, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we're basically creating a compatibility layer so someone can take their Cisco device or their Netgear device 
And if they can create a IPsec tunnel or an open VPN tunnel, um, we kind of provide a bridge for them to connect to us through those pro like pre existing protocols and hardware. And then that kind of taps them into our system and they can start using all the all the features and management, user management, and things like that. Right. So we're both backwards compatible, but also if you do have hardware that you're not you're using a solution, you don't have this expensive CISO box, you can use your currently you know existing hardware to use us. We're okay. providing software for a variety of platforms. So okay. I have a question over back. Have you looked at your profitability? If you're targeting really small businesses. It's how do you, do you have a plan to market to them and capture that market? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, we are actually working with some consultancies, some major consultancies in the, the Michigan area, starting out down here and working our way uh, around. And uh, we've actually had one-on-ones with a lot of these consultancies and asked them about their problem. They're actually facing a lot of the issues that we talked about, keeping things up to date, uh, costs, et cetera. And so they're really optimistic about this. They, uh, they really like this solution. Um, and so a lot of them have a variety of number of customers, anywhere from three-person shops to 150-person shops uh, that this could really benefit. Um, and so while you know they can't flip a switch and deploy this solution, they can slowly start migrating to it. And this will uh, help them out as well there. Uh, also, a lot of these consultancies actually have a laptop and they have nine or 10 uh, VPN clients of different software versions and revisions uh, that they have to log into to get to a certain company and it's actually really tedious for them. So we're actually kind of solving two issues there. So, and last question, I'm just about out of time. I'm gonna sneak it in. What's your ask from this group? What are you looking for in terms of feedback, resources, money? Yes, yeah, so we're not, you know, we're what, do you, what do you wanna ask this audience for? Yeah, we're, we're pretty new. Um, we're pretty new. We just went through the Spark Bootcamp program, a uh, fantastic program. So if anyone's looking at something like that, definitely look into it. But um, we're not raising money at this point, but we are just now entering our closed beta, so uh, any tech people, tech gurus out there that want to kind of Bang on pound this. on it and yep. just kind of play with it and, and test out kind of a, you know what a cloud VPN would look like, um, definitely sign up on our website and we'll get some beta access rolling out soon, probably the first of the year here. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. All right. So. So we wanted to get these guys out here for a while, and they said, yes, we can, we can get it in 2016. Uh, so next up, we have a couple, uh, a couple A2D Tech alums this evening. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome Cycle back to the stage here. Uh, this, these are our friends representing Toledo almost every month here at A2D Tech. Uh, Jake and Alex uh, have created Cycle. Cycle is a containers as a service platform that integrates container native features into a simple, yet powerful way to deploy and scale bare metal infrastructure around the world. Um, they gave us a great demo maybe like six months ago or so. They're going to update us this evening on uh, their progress before they leave town. They're moving out moving the company out to Reno, Nevada. Uh, so this is our, our send off to them. So take it away, guys. So, uh, well, I'm Jake Warner and this is Alex. Uh, and uh, so this is less of a pitch and more of uh, kind of an update from last time we were here back in April and also a demo at the end uh, for a new feature that we actually finished in the last week. Um. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, just a quick introduction to Cycle. Like you said, it was a, it's a containers a platform service. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with containers, but they're basically all the rage in the infrastructure world. Uh, we make it basically a two-click process to get any kind of software that runs locally on your computer running the exact same way, but globally distributed and running on uh, industry-grade infrastructure around the world. So since last time we were here, we, we've been incredibly busy. Uh, actually closed an investment round, starting on another, and then we did a lot of development. <laughs> uh, we've rebuilt our portal. Uh, we now have automated uh, DLS and SSL certificates for any of your containers. Uh, everything is geographically redundant now. Everything is self-repair. We have integrated DNS for all of our containers. And we also did sponsored by Tech and <laughs> So uh, actually, we're going to be talking about What's next, and our first step in what's next is tonight, we've released our API. Uh, we have our docs online as of about 15 minutes ago. 
Uh, so we're doing that on the way. Eight hour release today. Yeah. Um, got lots of plans to improve on that, but for tonight, you guys can go in, check in, and see what kind of information we'll get access to. Um, we've got a couple of uh, clients ready to go so that you can jump right in. I've written one in Node.js uh, in TypeScript. We've got one in Golang coming out very soon. Um, and then we're going to present a new feature tonight. Uh, we're going to show off our GeoDNS scaling. So we're going to deploy three instances of a container around the globe with the click of a button. Uh, and first, uh, if anyone wants to create an account, you can use this uh, promo code at the bottom and get... Uh, we can give that out after the presentation too if anybody missed it. Okay, right. so... Can we full screen that? Can make it bigger? Double click the title bar. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so uh, we created a, a new environment on Cycle. Um, and the environment is basically just a, a network group. All the containers within it have a private network, regardless of their geographic location. Uh, so we're going to create a quick container here. It's going to be just a quick test. A2 new. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, auto restart. We're going to hook it up to my one of the domains that I own. It's going to be interstellar.space. Super edgy. <laughs> uh, I've already imported the image, which I created this morning, to show off. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, that's the only thing that we've done to prepare for this. So no, none of these containers are deployed or anything right now. Yep. We're going to just choose a quick plan to deploy our container with. And here's the new feature. We've got GeoDNS selectable, and you're able to select multiple data centers that this container is able to be deployed into. So we're going to, we're going to distribute it to Chicago, Amsterdam, and Phoenix. We're going to do three instances, and we're going to hit Create. All right, should be up here. And right, we'll go to the instances tab. Uh, we'll go to instances. Can you zoom out now? Yeah. You can see the whole, the whole thing. All right. We'll click start. There we go. And now Cycle is automatically creating three instances around the globe with the click of a button. And once those are up and running, oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, three in each data center. So it does it in batches per data center. Uh, so we're going to have a total of nine instances of this software running, which is just a quick web server. Uh, but it's actually geographically sensitive, so it'll display different ones. I'm going to switch on my VPN, and we'll go to a different location in the world, hit the same exact uh, domain, you'll be able to see it's getting different locations. So since we are closest to Chicago, we yep. see Chicago. And At the top up there, we'll just go to London real quick. We're going to pretend to be in London. Uh, once that connects, through a VPN, uh, <laughs> which... We may know something about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, now we'll hit refresh. It connects? Yep. Good. <coughs> I, don't think oh, I don't think it connected yet. Okay, VPN. Does it, oh crap, does UMish allow VPN access? Mm -hmm. there. Oh, you need a Royal. You probably need to go off. <laughs> all right, well, I didn't consider that particular possibility. Well, let's see, how much time do I have? Because I can quickly hook 39 up. 39 seconds. Okay, so if any of your phones are like Verizon or something, where you might like be, even though you're here, like you might have the endpoint for your phone be out in like Kansas or something, you might be able to see some infrastructure out in, or the same thing, but out in Phoenix or if for whatever reason you have a VPN and you're connected back to somewhere in Europe, you'll get to see a picture of London right now. And so the, the whole process happened in about 20 seconds. Um, wow. And uh, we did our first kind of major test yesterday and deployed uh, about 50 instances in a matter of a couple seconds and didn't have any issues whatsoever, which was great for finishing the, the feature in the last week. Awesome, guys. Connect, 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 come on, T-Mobile. Don't fail me now. Let's <laughs> <laughs> give a round of applause. Uh, awesome update, guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can, uh, yeah. Did it. <laughs> These guys push the limits of live demos. I mean, without, without fail, every every time they. I mean, we did deploy our docs on the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're good at we're good at limits. So I can say they they ship and they're dedicated, and uh, it's awesome to see so much progress. Who would like to throw any questions out to Cycle? Start over here. Uh, Irina. Great question. Question we get asked all the time. Uh, so we think it's going to be one of the next big tech hubs. Uh, so like, great, well first it's you know only three hours from the Bay Area, but according to the cost of living, uh, they expect to have 2,000 new jobs in the next five years. They had 20 new companies moving there. Um, in 2016, they expected to increase. They had Tesla opening their Gigafactory there, and Switch has moved their headquarters there, and so a lot of companies are moving there. Um, and also Lake Tahoe, if anyone's ever been to Lake Tahoe. Like, <laughs> great, great work-life balance yeah. for when we're not in the office occasionally. Yeah, so, so another question right here. So where is the infrastructure for you? No, 
on this different location? Um, well, we're hosting through a company called Single Hop right now, which is a place that Jake used to work before he started Cycle. Um, yeah, so everything, so the biggest thing that we did mention in, in our demo is that everything in Cycle is bare metal. So, you know, we don't use AWS or DigitalOcean or anything like that. Um, any containers that you run on Cycle, which I think we are the, the first platform to implement both, uh, or fully implement OCI, which is the Open Container Initiative, and be bare metal. So, like, even though you can upload Docker containers and such to use on Cycle, um, Cycle doesn't, we don't actually use Docker in any of our infrastructure. Um, but it just makes it super easy. But yeah, so to answer your question right now, we have uh, infrastructure in Amsterdam, uh, Chicago, and Phoenix. With more to come. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? So are you still targeting people looking for more performance uh, out of their uh, hosted, you know, I mean, containers, I was going to say, or, or VMs, but like, who's your who's your target market? Right so right now? now, the target market is individual developers and small okay. startups that are like just creating the beginnings of their applications in with containers. Mm -hmm. um, people that want to not deal with infrastructure. Like when someone starts, like how we created that environment and then we uh, put our containers in it. And when people create environments on Cycle, we automatically build all the IPsec networks and everything. So they don't have to know anything about network security. They don't have to know anything about um, scaling. Like we did GeoDNS and you didn't have to modify anything. Like so that. is GeoDNS the one of the more differentiated features from another hosting provider? What what are what yeah. sets you guys apart yeah. other than, I don't know, I'm sure prices. So we have not, not, not the thing to mention. But. One of our main verticals is simplicity. Uh, we make it, I mean, you saw the interface. Mm -hmm. uh, usually dealing with containers is a, you see a black box and a blinking cursor and then it's up to you to figure out, read the docs, figure out how everything works. And a lot of, a lot of containers and service providers still work that way. You still have to push through there. Uh, there's very few that have a very easy to use interface. So we really focus on making sure that that's as easy as possible. Uh, same thing with our API. And you know, we make the docs incredibly clear. Uh, we're making it so that you can basically just say, here, Cycle, go do this. And then Cycle will take care of everything in the background without you having to worry about how, how are we going to scale this? Where are we going to be setting all these limits and all this configuration and all this pain that can come from that? Um, and then the other thing, like we said, uh, bare metal and performance. So they're, they're more uh, kind of you're putting your containers on the infrastructure that's running it on the native hardware. There's zero virtualization, so you're not going to have all these different layers that your program has to jump through to get access to the machine. And at, at the end of the day, where almost all the other container providers, they're focused on the development workflow. So it focuses on the production ready side. Um, so where once you have everything done, Slack makes it super easy to, that's why we focus on GeoDNS and scaling and things like that, where it's, it makes okay, sense. you're done, now it's time to, to run. Question back here. How do you guys do load balancing? So right now, uh, with the feature that we just did was just GeoDNS, which is not, which is kind of load balancing, but also not. Um, more for more for redundancy. But the next feature that we're the next step of that uh, that we're working on in January is uh, putting like HA proxy and such in front of each data center for each deployment, is what we call it. So that once you act, so then we'll, at that point we will GeoDNS uh, you know, do GeoDNS redundancy across your load balancer with different data centers. Okay, cool. So that, a lot of that's already pretty much ready to go, but yeah. we gotta, we're going to put it right in the interface. It should be ready sometime in the next couple months. Yeah, thanks. Nice. What do you like, offer that provider like Amazon or some of the big players don't offer? Why would I come to you instead of just going to them? So the biggest thing is like if you go to AWS and uh, like if you want to use containers on AWS, right now you have to get um, like AWS instance or um, you have to get um, your, whatever your instances are called. Yeah, anyway, it's kind of a, a virtual machine. And then you install Docker on top of it, and then that's just more load at the end of the day. And then as you start to scale, that issue gets harder. Because if Docker releases a new update, now you have to go around all your virtual machines and patch them. Um, and so with Cycle, like I said, the, the goal is for people that don't want to manage any of that. At the end of the day, they have their containers, they want to focus all their time on, on development. And uh, Cycle like will allow you to get running much faster. You don't have to, you don't have to customize anything. Like even with AWS, um, you might have to, you know, after you get the doctor installed and everything, you'll still have to configure your networks and things like that. There was one more question. I don't know if we want to get it in there. Squeeze it in. Sorry, Sorry. really quick. Um, so, number one, these guys are awesome. We're working on migrating our platform to them. They're, they're doing the best thing for, I've been working with containers since they came out and they're, they're doing some awesome stuff. So, um, one year from now, where do you want to be? What kind of customers do you want to have? How many features do you want to have? What's, what is your focus in terms of growth? So the big thing is, the second half of 2017 is when we actually are planning our push for businesses. Pretty much all, everything, all the focus right now is on community. 
uh, you know, getting individual or getting developers are talking. Uh, and then uh, with the second half, like I said, is businesses. And at that point, we'll have uh, automated backups, things like that. So then businesses won't have to really worry about right. the same thing. So the big thing that we keep putting is at the end of the day, anyone can make something complex. You have to make it simple to make it very valuable, I think. And so uh, what can we automate for businesses that no one else is? Um, those containers. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our second A2 New Tech alum is Christina York. Christina is here with Spellbound. Uh, if anyone you got to see, I think it was right around February or March earlier this year that Christina first pitched. Uh, she's made tremendous progress with, this, uh, with her startup, Spellbound, uh, which uses augmented reality technology to create tools that help pediatric therapists distract, engage, and entertain their patients. Fun fact about Christina. Not only is she Canadian, uh, but she also used to uh, work as a housekeeper at a hotel in Windsor, Ontario, where she met Run DMC one time and hung out with him. How about that? They need right. extra towels. <laughs> Everyone. Kick away, Christina. Thank you, Brian. I'm Christina York, a founder and CEO of Spellbound. Spellbound is a mobile augmented reality tool that helps pediatric therapists help kids cope with the hospital experience. Um, so nobody wants to be in the hospital. Hospital is tough for everybody, especially for kids. They don't understand what's going on. Um, and so the challenge for pediatric therapists is to get kids engaged with their treatment or therapy to get them home, get them well sooner. And when kids don't engage, um, because a lot of treatment is scary or painful, um, when they don't engage, this ends up increasing costs for hospital and increasing the trauma for the child. So we created um, augmented reality tools using the mobile devices that pediatric therapists already carry. Um, and I'm going to attempt the dreaded live demo <coughs> right now. Um, but what we do is bring... Um, everybody see? Oh, totally working. It's totally working. See, it's live. It's you out there. Um, so we bring print materials to 3D digital life. And so I'm going to point to this card. We're not getting any sound right now. But it's going to unfurl a little medieval world. So we create little virtual environments that can do things like distract or get kids engaged. I wish we had sound, but um, um, get kids engaged with these virtual worlds. So you can imagine, um, for pediatric therapists who might be using tools like this to <laughs> distract kids, this is gold. Um, this is something most kids have never seen before. <clears throat> so what does this really look like in real life? This is Jack. He's seven. He had a brain aneurysm. Before he can go home from the hospital, he has to relearn how to use his hands and fingers again. Um, so he has an occupational therapist and a physical therapist that work with him to redevelop these skills. But this rehabilitation is often painful and very frustrating. And so he doesn't want to do his therapy. When Jack doesn't do his therapy, um, his rehabilitation schedule gets pushed back. He can't go home. Um, so these therapists are using Spellbound with some books that we have it working with to um, get Jack to start to improve his accuracy in touching things or do the gestures that um, the therapists want him to do that are frustrating before. Um, this is Ivy. She's two and a half, and she needs to have a sleep study. And this usually involves two technicians taking one hour to prep her for. Um, they have to attach leads all over their head and body. They have to put a cannula up their nose, and they have to wrap them up like a mummy. You can imagine a two-year-old does not want to do this. Um, and when Ivy doesn't comply with this prep, if the prep takes longer, it delays the start, the start of her study, it delays the start of the other studies the technicians have to prep for, and this costs hospitals money. It also can ruin the data they collect from the studies. So with Spellbound, Ivy was so immersed in um, this augmented reality experience that she wasn't paying attention to what was happening around her. The sleep study prep was done in half the time and with no tears. So right now we are in, ooh, this is not where we are. Right now we are in um, a major pediatric hospital, one of the best in the country. Um, and all three therapy units that we target are using it. Pedi um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and child life specialists. 
We've also developed a strategic partnership with the Get Well Network. They are the number one provider of patient education and entertainment content in the country. Um, these are going to help us enter the market. Mm -hmm. And the market we focus on here is um, pediatric specialty hospitals and large health systems. And we're focusing on five main countries right now. Um, and this is before we start moving into adjacent. There's like super broad applications for this technology. Um, it's not just hospitals, it's not just children, it's adults, it's dentistry patients. So we're a software as a service. We come in right now because we have very little content in the platform at a low and affordable price. Um, but that's not the full value of the contract over the life of, of um, our relationship with the hospital because we work with print and physical objects like books or cards. Um, hospitals have to purchase these as well. Um, and often they gift it to patients to take home with them so the parents can also use it with their children. As I mentioned, this is what we compete against right now. Um, also consumer apps, which are not always appropriate for use in a hospital environment. Um, Spellbound, by con contrast, um, is, works on the devices that the therapists carry with them. It's part of their workflow. Um, it requires less than 15 minutes of training. And we are looking to raise a seed round next year and looking for talent. So if anybody knows C Sharp, Unity, modeling, animation, or knows somebody who knows these things, um, we are looking to talk to you. Mm. Thanks. He's got some questions for Christina in the middle. Um, so talking about your competition, uh, when you say that, like conventional apps, you know, games, uh, interactive experiences, just you know, uh, without the, the in real life element, uh, when you say that those aren't really meant for hospitals, like what do you mean? So a lot of factors on that. Um, the first factor is um, data collection in the app. There's various rigid policies in hospitals around what apps are you kind of usage data and other things. Um, there's a whole button, hit button, other kinds of compliance things that you need to be concerned about. Um, a lot of them require account systems and all types of things that just aren't allowed. They have ads in them. They're not actually age appropriate or therapy focus. Um, and the other thing is that hospitals have um, very unreliable and weird infrastructure. So if you're near the MRI machine, you can't rely on the network to be downloading and running an interactive app. And when a physical therapist has 30 minutes to work with that child and they do progressive therapy, which means each activity builds on the previous one, you lose connection, you lose that app in the middle, you've lost 30 minutes of therapy. So um, while they work and there's many popular things that kids like to do, they're often the things they already have at home, so they're not new and different, and uh, so less effective. I'm actually a pediatrician, so I've worked with kids. Have you gotten feedback from pediatricians? As as I specifically, um, echo when doing echo for kids. If you can replace sedating them and doing an echo, that's huge. I mean, health-wise. Um, but also, have you looked at? There's, I guess, two-part question: the feedback and um, clowning, medical clowning. That's, I think, one of your potential competitors. Oh, yes. Um, so in terms of, we've, we have talked with some pediatricians, primarily the, the input we've had were from child life specialists, occupational therapists, those are the biggest um, tutors that, um, and with a few nurses as well. Um, we spend a lot of time actually in MOT, shadowing people, um, getting, you know, volunteering, going into the rooms, watching the kids. Um, trying to understand the limitations, not only of the hospital environment, but remember, you're working with kids that are sick or in pain or frustrated and scared, like all these emotions that make it crazy. So we spend a lot of time shadowing. We're looking to um, partner with some of the professional associations, so we have access to broader networks of experts. We're not clinicians, we're technologists, and we're gamers. And so we, um, those are key relationships. So you're pointing out the nutrition's well taken. Um, Clowning, yes. They have the superhero programs that come in. Um, so what we think, while you are right about the, uh, um, the competition, 
There's a lot of, as you know, kids can be in isolation where the clown can't visit them. Or there's events at the hospital, like where the superheroes could, like climb the windows and maybe outside the room, that's okay. But if there's like, at Mott, they had a butterfly release party and not all children could go down and enjoy it. And what we're trying to do with augmented reality is bring some of those magical experiences that the hospital's offering to every child, even if they're isolated in a room, whether they can get up and move or not. So we're trying to use those devices that are easily accessible to families and the staff to be able to do that. Question back. First of all, what a beautiful use of technology. Congratulations. Um, does it require, the application require a handheld device all the time? In other words, if a, if a patient cannot physically hold the device, do they have access to the service? Or do you have a solution for that? Or? Um, we don't have a solution for that right now. Um, we have started looking at developing for headsets. We're particularly in handheld ones right now, but that's not always accessible. You can always pull something like sure. that. Um, the other um, I forget what I was going to say. I have a good answer to your question. <laughs> well, I, I just, I'm just curious about the deployment. Yeah. Does it require a physical thing? It does. And the therapists often have already have solutions to hold devices okay. for the children. Um, hospitals already have those kind of mechanics in place. So when the child's brought down to the OT, they can take room, or when it's in room, those therapists are bringing that equipment with them. As long as the patient can visually engage, yes. somebody can physically. There's also a way that the therapists, says, I didn't invent this, I wish I said it, I thought of it, but the, they're getting parents involved in the therapy in new ways. When the parents engage in the therapy, so sometimes it's holding and positioning, then it, those parents actually end up continuing that practice at home and even you know speeding the recovery along. So it's um, they've been using it and engaging parents in that. Okay. One last question. And how is it therapy focused specifically to the child? So like different therapy goals, like you know, by motor, gross motor, etc. Yeah. So um, we've developed it with the input of those therapists to begin with. So we started out with technology, and when they saw it, they uh, actually our market was originally education. So we pivoted our market once we encountered some child life specialists. Um, so they we worked with child life specialists and teachers to understand what engages kids, even kids who are difficult to engage, and um, what things have worked for them in the past. Um, we we've, we've got like kind of a library of interactions that we know work in certain situations. So we use them like. Spam and the child wants to use the motor over again. Um, with the motor skills, it's more about like creating different target sizes and different requirements around that. Whether you're trying to prove precision, like repeating an action over and over with accuracy, or are you trying to um, just get them to like move in a general direction? Um, so some of the different oh, I have different size cards and different size things for physical materials play into it, and um, I'm playing to the positioning of it. So whether it's gross motor skills, pushing around legs and head, or Fingers. That's how we look. Yeah. Christine will be around. Good All right, next up, uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Ryan and Steve uh, from OpenGov. OpenGov is creating the smart government cloud platform that helps leaders plan, operate, and communicate with citizens. Uh, this is a fun personal one for me. I've known Steve for a very long time. He's actually in from San Francisco where the company is headquartered. Ryan here is based locally in Ann Arbor and is growing uh, a team uh, that couldn't be remote and we hope to get more of them in Ann Arbor. So this is an opportunity to learn a little bit about OpenGov and uh, I'll let you guys give the, give the full spiel. Awesome. Hi everyone. Yeah, as, as Brian said, I'm, I'm Ryan and this is Steve, uh, my colleague Steve. And uh, yeah. Excited to share with you a little bit about OpenGov today. Uh, a big part of our focus as a company is using technology to solve problems that today's government faces. Um, and one thing that's important to note is that this is a solution that is tailored for governments. It's not something that is uh, a, a business tool that we're kind of saying, well, if you do, do a couple things differently, you can use this for a government as well. So we work on um, software for governments. And we found that um, the traditional government management life cycle consists of three parts. Planning, operate, and communicating. Um, and the planning phase is like the, the budget process. That's, that's a big part of um, any government is figuring out how uh, resources are going to be allocated. Operating is the day-to-day -day management and the kind of things that, uh, that happen here. And communicating is uh, talking with uh, stakeholders and citizens about what's going on um, with the government. And the technology that's currently there is, uh, has some challenges with it. 
So for the planning phase, for the budget, for creating a budget, this is a huge amount of manual work that goes into this. Um, and it's, it makes, uh, because there's a, a lot of manual processes, it makes collaboration very difficult. On the operating side, um, a lot of times governments are seen as um, uh, spending, for, um, seen as people who are or organizations that spend money instead of uh, making smart decisions, but they, they want to make smart decisions, but that's difficult a lot of times um, because of how the data is stored and how um, access to the data um, isn't readily available in many cases. And uh, along, along the lines of the communicating, um, the data is often presented in a way that's not relatable to the citizens in a, in, or in a way that's very easy to understand. So we work to solve that with our OpenGov, OpenGov Cloud software. We have our OpenGov Budget Builder, and um, as a developer, I kind of see this as like GitHub for budgeting. Um, you create proposals and um, kind of submit those proposals for review. Today, governments are just sending spreadsheets around, and so you have <laughs> hundreds of spreadsheets, and they're getting updated, and there's no versioning or central place to store those. Yeah. Um, and then OpenGov Intelligence, which is how um, governments can make decisions with the data that they already have and not have to say uh, that they need data from a different department. They can just um, go to the reports that they have and get that data. Uh, and communicate. We have the OpenGov Open Data Transparency and Performance Dashboards that stakeholders and shareholders, uh, I'm sorry, stakeholders and citizens can use to um, view the data. And we're on 1,300 governments in 47 states. And I'd like to show you a couple of quick examples. We're gonna look at our budget product, which Ryan and I have been working on together for the last year. Yeah, we're pretty excited about this one. Um, but let's say we have a budget. This one, I only have three items in the budget right now. These are proposals. These are the things that I'm saying I want to um, make an adjustment to this and say I want this to show up in our new budget. So I'm gonna to go to the computers. Um, we have a title and a description here, um, just to kind of see what this is. We can add supporting documents that say, um, this is why we, this is how we're justifying this. I'm going to go into this operation and say that I want to adjust some of these things uh, and see what the impact is. So I have a visualization on top and once, uh, once this saves, um, having a little bit of some network delay here. Um, that one's a little slow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to make sure it didn't kick you off sometimes it, uh, it does that on the captive portal. So really what we allow our users to do here governments is to visually slice and dice their budget in any way that is familiar to them and then look at those slices and make decisions for, you know, what do we want to do in terms of big initiatives next year and like find the money to do those. Too often governments do what they've always done and you know maybe bump things up by a few percentage points. So the, the visualization even for numbers people is like a great way for them to look at the budget and make decisions and take it to you know city council meetings and show the mayor and kind of do better at communicating and tell the story what, of what they're doing year to year. Yeah, and then um, when we get to the end we can say we want to finalize this budget and then we can use it in our other products that we talked about, other our business intelligence, the, the data set that's generated from this. Um, and uh, kind of share, share that in between our different products. All right, thanks guys. I've got some questions for Steve. Right. Um, let me think about how to phrase this briefly. Do you have the ability to sort of draft your proposed budget items so that another user could, for example, uh, edit what you've suggested and send it back without actually overwriting your original suggestion? Yeah, you sure do. So really, really we've designed this to be very collaborative and to allow multiple folks within a government to work on the same numbers. Um, now, there'll be like a finance director or what we call a budget administrator who kind of reviews everything. And one of the nice things about our system, you know, to use the GitHub analogy, like they can see a diff of what's changed as opposed to having to review everything that's in a spreadsheet. But it does allow drafts and so you could kind of work on proposals and then submit those to, say, the city council. 
So this would be more for municipalities and maybe state governments, not opposed to like, uh, well, like federal government, but it'd be more municipalities and the transparency as far as communication would be more for voters to, if there's a plan that they're trying to implement where they're trying to get revenue um, for, you know, to people to approve it. And it's more in that, that That's line. exactly right. Yeah, we first started doing transparency, kind of just making, making what government was doing, making more sense to everyday citizens. Sometimes we kind of lump city council and the mayor and that category too. Right. Um, yes. Um, I saw you guys had an open document management uh, part of the system. Uh, do you deal with like full text search on old documents that weren't digitized in the past? Um, I'm not sure that we do right now. We, we do some natural language processing magic on some PDF budgets to ingest some of the data, but in yes. terms of our like, open data solution, we don't do a whole lot with like document processing and that sort of thing. Okay. Are you guys out of the Bay Area? Um, yeah, so the, the company's based out of the Bay Area. We have some, some other offices throughout the country. How did you guys get into recent? Um, that, I, I don't know that I can speak to too well. I mean, as far as like a, a board member. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Mark is passionate about this area, and um, you know, had a few people had known about the company and were, and were excited about it, and so oh, shared, cool. shared it with them. Um, yeah, so we're, we're in Redwood City, California, but we're a community. We're kind of expanding to a few other cities. We open an office in Portland, and then um, Ann Arbor is on the top of our list of other cities we may expand to. Cool. 47 states, quite impressive. How long did it take you to get these slow decision-making municipalities? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like 10 years of work. How long did it take you to get 47 on board? Roughly. It's been about four years. Yeah. I, I, we have our customers who came on initially are a little more progressive, I would say, than maybe your stereotypical view of government. But I think actually a misconception, a misconception about governments is that they're slow and don't understand or spend money on RT, and that's actually not always the case. Um, they've been underserved, and so I think that's one of the exciting things about our company. Is What's the highest it? level of government that you do? You have, do you have a relationship with the state, or is it just we work with state, state counties? States um, yeah, cities, state, counties. Okay. Starting to evaluate federal space. Like you mentioned, federal budgeting and state budgeting are okay. quite different. Yeah. yeah. Good question over here. Uh, you mentioned that previously these municipalities were passive around Excel spreadsheets. What other sort of older applications have you found yourself replacing in their workflow? Green screen accounting systems, yeah. Microsoft Amazing. Access. Lotus Notes, spreadsheets, <laughs> yeah. Do you have to integrate with those systems, like older ERPs and things like that? We, we do um, have some ingestion from ERPs. Okay. Yeah. But the idea is that people are using your, as the, their, really their primary interface, that they're interacting with this kind of information. That's the goal, especially for the, yeah, for like the budgeting, it's like, you, this should be the product that people are collaborating on. Okay. Okay. Any more questions for these guys? Other in the middle. Another slightly simple question for you: Have you worked up a, an exporting system to integrate back into Excel, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can take your collaborative form and export it in a format that's easily visible as a collaborative project outside of your software? Yeah, we do um, export some from some areas of our applications into, uh, into CSV, um, and, and I know that we're looking into other ways that. Be any any great examples of how citizens have interacted uh, like with their government more effectively via OpenGov to wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some cases just putting a transparency portal allows governments to kind of say like, okay, things are out there. But you, there is in, in a lot of municipalities we work with kind of a small group of very active citizens who are very sensitive to budget issues and also like like to play around with the data and so we have had um, a number of customers who actually like said yeah like folks had looked at our budget in advance of a review came to a council meeting prepared and actually had ideas for how we could like you know save money or you know outsource something and you know with data it's, it's suggestions but you know i mean i think like the the and we allow citizens to submit feedback directly to the website too so there's kind of like the foia information request aspect of it so that you can request to open data or ask a question through our platform. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks.
much of the evening. Uh, also, a uh, second timer to A2 Tech uh, Duran from iLod Radio is going to tell us about his. Uh, it's not really like, I don't have the right product pitch here. A journey into music inspiration 2.0. Uh, and you gave me a lot of fun facts about yourself, so I'm gonna like try to condense here. I think what Duran, I think what you take away from this is Duran's been in music for a while. Started playing snare drums at age six, DJing at age nine. Ran a production company at age 16, started a record label at 19 between LA and New York, uh, music producing at 23 between Detroit and Atlanta. Conceived iLod Radio at 25 and is launching in uh, this upcoming year right now. It's better to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this one is off off the record, so we're not gonna record. So take this. good notes, because you're not gonna. Yeah, see it so this is exclusive to the audience in here, because John wanted to show some things that are uh, interesting stuff he's working on that's kind of competitive in nature to other services you might imagine in music right now. All right, I know there's probably more questions, but I gotta cut this one right now. You'll be around if anyone wants to grab you afterwards. So okay. thanks so much. Thanks, thanks guys. Yeah. That's a wrap for our pitches. Hope you enjoyed the variety that we had this evening. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Uh, now, community announcements. So, if you'd like to make an announcement about a meetup you're hosting, excuse me. <coughs> if you're hiring, if you're looking for a certain type of talent, you can come down here and up front and you can make the, your announcements out to this group. And we'll start right down here. Uh, my name is Hannah. I work for the Center for Entrepreneurship at the university, and we are having a startup career fair, which is probably exciting both for students and startups. So if you are looking to hire, I have hires. Uh, we have different registration options, and obviously we want to be inclusive to everyone. Registration options start at $300, but if you cannot afford that or if you have other obligations, you can talk to me right now. and. We could try to set something up. And this is the 15th? Is it it's what is it? January 12th. I January 12th. January 12th, so it's coming up. Um, the registration link is on here for both students and companies. I'll pass this around. Cool. All right. What is this one? It's a student uh, entrepreneur career fair. For so it's a startup career fair, and I work at the Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah, leave them up front. I would. Awesome. Yeah. Is that in January? January 12th. January 12th. My name is Tina Watson. I work for GE. We're not exactly a startup, although there's <laughs> there are some startup cultures going on. Um, I wanted to mention in 2017, we'll be hiring between 150 and 200 developers. GE, if you haven't seen what Jeff Immelt's doing with his strategy, is shifting very heavily into the software space. And Van Buren Township is where our offices are, so there's lots of different opportunities for developers. So you won't have to lift that hammer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Love, love anchor companies that are helping grow this community. So thanks for coming. Anyone else? Light, light on announcements. No one's got anything else to share. I mean, I threw a link on the Meetup Group website to the cycle page with the um, coupon code A2 New Tech 2 because it's a long one with a lot of letters. So, so make sure you get your $50 to the platform. Um, it's good for a full year or until it runs out. Great. Um, so we'll keep doing this. Uh, we'll be back. I'll get you in a sec. Uh, we'll be back uh, next month, uh, third week in January, January 17th. Uh, if you know anybody that might like to present or you want to present, organizers at a2newtech.org. Ryan, at a reminder of announcement? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't call us out as much during our, present, our, our presentation, but um, we are hiring. Um, and. Uh, we're hiring front end, back end, um, like across the, the tech stack. So, if anybody is looking for anything and um, OpenGov sounded interesting, um, we have opengovcom slash careers, or you can talk to myself or Steve after. after if Ryan can find enough people to hire, but he can get an office <laughs> in <Ann Arbor. laughs> where you can work from, not just from your house. Unless you like working from your house, I'm sure you can do that too. <laughs> Um, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, I'm sure some folks will be going over to Pizza House, uh, so stop by and ask additional questions of anyone who presented tonight. People will mull around here for a little bit, and uh, happy holidays. See you, see you around.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know they are. 